just like the incredible career and work of Marion Wright Edelman, a leader, perhaps the leader on what our nation must do to meet the needs of all of our children. She is a voice for all children. She draws on the experiences of her own childhood, one of five children born to a mother and father who instilled in her the spirit and compassion for others. She draws on her own experience as a parent, a mother who raised three boys with her husband and who understands firsthand the dreams, the challenges, the hopes, the worries, the absolute joys that come with being a parent. And of course, she draws on the incredible experiences she has had during this incredible career. Her time at Spelman College and her legal education at Yale Law School. Her early advocacy for Head Start and other federal programs for children and families in poverty. In 1967, with Senator Robert Kennedy, on his now famous journey to Mississippi, where he was so very moved and called to act by the dire and impoverished conditions he saw related to the children and their families. Through her tireless advocacy, the Children's Defense Fund, which she founded in 1970, has grown into an organization that is recognized throughout the entire world. So much has been achieved, and yet I'm sure we will hear this evening about how much more we need to do. We, each and every one of us. Marion Wright Edelman's work has never been more important, and we are privileged to hear her speak this evening about her new book. While preparing for this evening, I learned that Marion Wright Edelman is actually named for another great American, Marion Anderson, the famed African-American opera star. In 1939, Miss Anderson was prevented from singing a concert in Washington's Constitution Hall because of one thing, the color of her skin. Led by Eleanor Roosevelt, another concert was organized on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial the image of Marian Anderson standing on the stain, stage and singing, My Country Tis of Thee, in front of 75,000 people is unforgettable. Her voice strong, her message clear, her dignity moving and inspiring. Tonight, with a different Marian, Gratefully, we can say her voice is strong, her message is clear, and her dignity moves and inspires us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our incredible speaker. Children's movement, which we're going to have to have, is going to depend on us. I have a voice. Well, the Children's Defense Fund is for all children. It's the most exciting program of hope um, and independence um, for parents and children. Every movement needs a school for training and skills. And Haley Farm is our movement building home. It, it's our place where we vision what we want to see for children and then gain the skills and the courage to go out and build it. 
And we've been training another generation of young people, which is the most exciting thing. I need training. I will take the necessary steps. I am ready. I am ready to read. I am ready to read. I am ready to read. I am ready. The Children's Defense Fund's parent organization was born in the middle of the Poor People's Campaign. And it was very clear that children don't come in pieces. So we had to address the needs of the whole child. I need someone to care about me. To care about me. And it was wonderful to have 9,000 children marching um, to talk about health care for every child and to be empowered and see a seven-year-old standing up on Capitol Hill. I recently learned about the issue of health care in America, and it made me very sad. A healthy child is a child who is um, alive, excited about life, safe, vibrant, um, is in good health, has health care. I need health care. Health care. Health care is um, excited about learning, um, is excited about their future, can see a future and see how um, they will um, be able to move beyond today to tomorrow. I have a future. I have a future. A bright future. I will make a difference tomorrow. They are confident, um, they feel loved, um, and they feel respected. I will not be abused or neglected. I will not be abused or neglected. I will not go away. There's something inside of them that's so strong that nobody can touch. I can speak for myself. I have a voice. A voice. A voice. A voice. I have a voice. You think a voice? I have a voice. What we're trying to do is to build empowered children, competent children, loved and loving children, and healthy children who um, are ready to go out um, and seize and lead the world. I am not a number. I am not a number. I am not a statistic. I am not a statistic. You're not I am not a number. There are a number of laws that would, would not be on the books. I think at CDF's reports and lobbying and um, public education campaigns and organizing would not have made it possible. I'm very proud of the fact that all children go to school. We tend to forget that children were the frontline soldiers in the civil rights movement. It was little Ruby Bridges, six years old, who went through the mobs. The Children's Spence Fund is committed to changing the odds and creating a level playing field for every child. Who can help me stay out of trouble? Who can help me stay out of trouble? Stay out of trouble. When the bus will end up in prison. I need a plan to succeed. I need a plan to succeed now. To succeed now. I need a chance. I need a chance. A chance. I need a chance. Not a handout. Not a handout. Not a handout. I have the potential to be great. I have the potential to be great. We're trying to pass the torch so that the movement can sustain itself. It doesn't do any good um, to do new policies if they're not strong servant leaders out there who are going to implement them. And so we're trying to change the paradigm in America because it is the children of the world who are going to determine the future. I think that this is the most important work and it's been a privilege to be a part of it. I have a future. future and if we don't invest in them today I'm convinced that they will be our moral and economic Achilles heel. I think that we're all in the middle of an economic downturn, indeed an economic debacle, but it's going to pale in comparison to our continued neglect we to educate and raise a new generation of children who can compete in the new century. So our message is it is the right thing to do to invest in our children. It is the cost-effective thing to invest in our children, but it is absolutely the necessary thing to do is invest in our children if we are going to remain world leaders. So there's nothing more important that any of us can be doing um, than seeing that all our children can go into the new century educated and healthy and connected to community and family 
And it's a privilege to be here tonight with people who are committed to achieving that same goal. I thank you for that lovely introduction, Mary Jane. Thank the Dean of the School of Education. I thank Elaine Patricelli and her wonderful bookstore. Um, I thank um, um, the uh, Denise. Um, you have been um, it, very welcoming, and I can feel the hospitality in this place, and I'm delighted um, to be in this wonderful university. We have pushed so many of our children into the tumultuous sea of life. In small and leaky boats without survival gear and compass, I hope they will forgive us, and I hope that um, God will forgive us. I hope we will be all moved to give all of our children the anchors of faith and love, the rudders of purpose and hope, the sails of health and education, and the paddles of family and community to keep them safe and strong when life's sea gets rough. In this first decade of a new century, our nation and the world, I believe, have veered alarmingly off track, become less safe, less just, more precarious, and balkanized. The gap between rich and poor in the United States and in the world are the highest ever recorded. A cloud of nuclear annihilation hangs over every child and human being. Global warming threatens, warming threatens our Earth, and before and after 9-11, we have come too slowly to recognize the oneness of our poorest world where disease, pollution, climate change, and terrorism know no borders and require collaborative solutions. And the militarism, the excessive materialism, the racism, and the poverty that Dr. Martin Luther King warned could lead to our national and global destruction still run rampant. Violence stalks children and all of us everywhere. The pollution of our air, water, food, and earth, and the coarsening discourse of our airwaves, internet, and media leave virtually no child untouched. Moral, community, and family values are frayed, and millions of children in all race and income groups are growing up without hope and a sense of moral purpose. Adult hypocrisy in too many homes, schools, communities, religious institutions, and private and public sector policies is confusing and leading many children astray as they do what we adults do rather than what we say. And I believe it's time for us adults to get our act together and stop dropping the ball of responsibility for our children's well-being and future. In the United States, we have a child and youth problem because we have a profound adult problem. Children, all children, need positive and authentic adult role models and voices challenging our cultural addictions to power, money, celebrity, violence, alcohol, drugs, as well as obsessive materialism and individualism. They need to see leaders developing a concept of enough for all and fairer policies as the rich get richer, as children get poorer. All children need adults to teach them how to struggle with complexity, to think through the short and long-term consequences of their actions, to bounce back from life's inevitable failures, to learn how not to be lonely when alone, to think, ask the right questions, solve problems, sort out and synthesize reams of information, make informed judgments and take effective action, to sacrifice and to, in order to build a fairer and safer world and to listen to the sound of the genuine which according to the gospels and prophets of every great faith dwells within each of us. While 13 million underprivileged children in the richest nation on earth are growing up in indefensible poverty without the most basic necessities of life and a fair chance to envisage a better future, Millions of overprivileged children are growing up infected with the affluenza virus, the spiritual poverty of having too much that is worth too little. Given every material thing they desire, cell phones, iPods, fancy cars, and the latest trendy fashions, while living in big houses and well-to-do neighborhoods, many lack sufficient parental and community attention, limit setting, spiritual guidance, and moral example. 
They roam around in peer herds from one place to another, trying out drugs and alcohol and tobacco and loveless sex and race and gay bashing, seeking entertainment and thrills with increasingly high thresholds for the bizarre and violent, just like many of the children left behind in the ghettos and barrios. These lost adrift children in all income groups and racial groups are desperately crying out for attention, for direction, and protection from parents and other responsible adults. I wrote this book because I don't want my grandchildren who have radicalized me all over again, or any child growing up in a rich nation that thinks it can imprison its way out of the glaring inequities in our society and suck poor children of color into a pipeline to prison. I don't want them growing up with leaders infected with a sense of entitlement, who think we can bully our way to world leadership through hubris and military might rather than moral right. I don't want them growing up in a nation that continues to marginalize and mistreat millions of children and people of all ages because of their color, income, disability, gender, faith, or ethnicity. I don't want them growing up in a country that gives lip service to equal opportunity while neglecting the poor and sick and the orphan and the stranger that our faith traditions enjoin us to help. And I don't want them growing up in a culture that objectifies and degrades any of our daughters or where any of our sons believe that manhood comes from seeking superiority over women and that fatherhood ends with conception. And I don't want them growing up believing that prophets are more important than people, that missiles are more important than mothers, that bombs are more important than babies, that sacrifice is a dirty word and nonviolence is for softies. I know that we can change these problems, which we have let ourselves drift into. And while I do share a lot of sobering realities in this book, this is not a doom and gloom book. It is a wake up, get off your duff, and stand up and reclaim our children, families, community, moral values, and our nation, and let's do it together. It's a call to conscience and to action and to leadership for all who seek to build and leave the world we hold in trust for the next generations better than those than we found it. And I know what can happen. We have all lived, I grew up in a period which I feel so lucky about, to have seen the transformation of our nation and world in ways that we could not have believed possible in a lifetime. Who would have thought that few mothers and fathers and, and poor group of band of lawyers could challenge legal racial apartheid in our country and bring crumbling down centuries old walls of racial segregation? And we saw the courageous witness of a small minority of children like Little Ruby Bridges and the Little Rock Nine and others who were the frontline soldiers. And they did all of these things because they wanted a decent education and the parents because they wanted to, a better life for their children. And all those citizens who built a civil rights movement to end segregation in American life deserve our thanks, but they also deserve our emulation to finish the job of putting the social and economic underpinnings beneath those political and civil rights. Um, civil rights without a job or a means of eating, without decent housing, without an education, without health care, is hollow. And Dr. King understood that at his death as he called for a poor people's campaign. We've seen the fall of the Berlin Wall in our lifetime, symbolizing the end of the Cold War, and we've seen the breakup of the Soviet Union and communism crumble across Eastern Europe, and we watched in awe as Nelson Mandela walked out of jail after 27 years, offering a kind hand of reconciliation to his former jailers. And you and I now have the opportunity in 2008 and the awesome responsibility to compose and to play the next movement of America's symphony of freedom and justice, to forge a nation and communities where more good people outplan and outmobilize less good people, where more people fight for justice than those who fight to maintain an unjust status quo, where more people committed to nonviolence outorganize and challenge those who saturate our nation with guns and destabilize or destroy our nations with war. Together we can build a nation that will be able to pass the test of the God of history. Asking whether we gave food to the hungry and clothes to the naked and cared for the sick and visited those in prison, gave water to the thirsty, and saw and helped the least of these my children. 
79 years ago, a black baby boy named Martin Luther King Jr. was born in America. He grew up to become our greatest 20th century American prophet. He was killed in 1968 as he called on us to end our warring and greedy ways, the poverty staining our wealthy land, and to confront the triple evils of militarism, materialism, and racism that would lead to our destruction. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, his good friend, believed that the whole future of America depended on his impact and influence. And I agree, and I wanted to write a letter to him and to our leaders and to us citizens reporting to him on our progress and what remains to be done. But also write letters to all of us because we face great challenges, although we have made great progress. And I think that it is time for us to move forward to realize America's and Dr. King's great dream. The day that he was assassinated, he called his mother from Memphis to give her his next Sunday sermon title, and that was why America may go to hell. And he said that America is going to hell if we don't use her vast resources to end poverty and make it possible for all of God's children to have the basic necessities of life. And I wanted to, to, to share as I go into my deep concern about what is happening to America's sixth child in the cradle to prison pipeline, a very moving poem that Ann Weems, um, whom I recommend to you, W-E-E-M-S, wrote, um, along with many other moving things, but it, 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 it really touched my heartstrings. It's called Greenless Child. Anne writes, I watched her go uncelebrated into the second grade, a greenless child, gray among the orange and yellow, attached too much to corners and to other people's sunshine. She colors the rainbow brown and leaves balloons unopened in their packages. Oh, who will touch this greenless child? Who will plant alleluias in her heart and send her dancing into all the colors of God? Or will she be left like an unwrapped package on the kitchen table, too dull for anyone to take the trouble? Does God think that she, that we are her keeper? Well, imagine God visiting our very wealthy family blessed with six children. Five of them have enough to eat and comfortable rooms in which to sleep. One does not. She's often hungry and cold, and on some nights she has to sleep on the streets or in a shelter or even be taken away from her neglectful family and placed in foster care or group homes with strangers. Imagine this rich family giving five of its children nourishing meals three times a day, snacks to fuel boundless energy, but sending the sixth child from the table into school hungry with only one or two meals and never the dessert the other children enjoy. Imagine this very wealthy family making sure five of its children get all their shots regular health checkups before they get sick and immediate access to health care when illness strikes, but ignoring the sixth child, who is plagued by chronic respiratory infections and painful toothaches, which sometimes abscess and kill for lack of a doctor or a dentist. Imagine this family sending five of their children to good, stimulating preschools and making sure they have music and swimming lessons after school but sending the sixth child to unsafe daycare with untrained caregivers responsible for too many children, or leaving her occasionally with an accommodating relative or neighbor or older sibling or even all alone. Imagine five of the children living in homes with books and families able to read to most of their children every night, but leaving the other child unread to, untalked and unsung to, unhugged or propped before a television screen or a video game, that feeds him violence and sex and racially and gender charged messages, intellectual pablum, interrupted only by ceaseless ads for material things beyond the child's grasp. Imagine this family sending some of their children to high quality schools and safe neighborhoods with enough books and computers and laboratories and science equipment and well-prepared teachers and sending the sixth child to a crumbling school building with peeling ceilings and leaks and lead in the paint and asbestos and old, old books and not enough of them, and teachers untrained in the subjects they teach and with low expectations that all children can learn, especially the sixth child. 
Imagine most of the family's children being excited about learning and looking forward to finishing high school, going to college, and getting a job, and the sixth child falling further and further behind grade level, not being able to read, wanting to drop out of school, and being suspended and expelled at younger and younger ages because no one has taught him to read and compute or diagnosed his attention deficit disorder or treated his health and mental health problems and helped him keep up with his peers. Imagine five of the children engaged in sports and music and arts and after school and summer programs and camps and enrichment efforts and the sixth child hanging out with peers or going home alone because mom and dad are working or are in prison or have run away from their parenting responsibilities and escaped in drugs and alcohol, leaving him alone or on the streets during idle non-school hours and weeks and months, at risk of being sucked into illegal activities and the prison pipeline or killed in our gun-saturated nation. Well, this is our American family today where one in six of all of our children lives in poverty in the richest nation on earth, more than 40% in extreme poverty, and we've had an increase of 200,000 children in extreme poverty over the last year, and that was before this economic downturn. It is not a stable, healthy, economically sensible, or just family. Our failure to invest in all of our children before they get sick or drop out of school and get into trouble is morally indefensible and extremely costly. Every year we let 13 million children live in poverty, cost $500 billion in lost productivity and the cost of crime and, and health denial. You cannot hurt others, especially children, without consequences. And contrary to popular stereotypes, America's sixth child is more than twice as likely to live in a working family than to be on welfare, is more likely to be white than black or Latina, and is more likely to live in a rural or suburban area than in an inner city. But black and Hispanic children are at far greater risk of being poor and of entering the cradle to prison pipeline. The most dangerous place for a child to struggle to grow up in America is at that intersection of race and poverty. Racial disparities still permeate all the major American institutions that shape the life chances of millions of children. Undergirded by poverty, these disparities are putting countless children at risk of incarceration and funneling hundreds of thousands of them every year into a pipeline to prison and often to death derailing their chances for reaching successful adulthood. Incarceration is becoming the new American apartheid, and poor children of color are the fodder. And as leaders and as citizens, as parents, as faith leaders, as educators, we must all see, understand, and sound the alarm about the threat to American unity and community. Act to stop this growing criminalization of children at younger and younger ages and tackle the unjust treatment of minority youths and adults in the juvenile and adult criminal justice systems with urgency and persistence. The failure to act now will, and I believe, reverse the hard-earned racial and social progress that Dr. King and so many others died in sacrifice for and weaken our future capacity to lead in the credibility of America's dream. So all leaders in all sectors must call for investment in all children from birth through their successful transition to adulthood, remembering Frederick Douglass's correct observation that it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So many poor babies in rich America enter the world with multiple strikes against them, born without prenatal care, at low birth weight, and to a teen, poor, or poorly educated single mother and absent father. At crucial points in their development after birth until adulthood, more risks pile on, making a successful transition to productive adulthood significantly less likely and contact and involvement in the criminal justice system significantly more likely. Since children of color always have been disproportionately poor, their odds of incarceration as adults greatly exceed that of white children. Black children are more than three times as likely as white children to be poor and are almost six times as likely as white children to be incarcerated. 
A black boy today who is seven years old has a one in three lifetime risk of going to prison. A Latino boy, a one in six chance, a black girl and a white boy, a one in 17 chance of going to prison in their lifetime. And the past continues to strangle the present and the future. Children with an incarcerated parent are more likely to become incarcerated. Black children are nearly nine times and Latino children three times as likely as white children to have an incarcerated parent. Blacks constitute one-third and Latinos one-fifth of our imprisoned population. And one in three black men, 20 to 29 years old, who need to be fathers in the home is under congressional supervision or control. And we all know that we now have the dubious distinction of being the world's largest jailer. We have over 2 million people in prison, 2.3 million people in prison or jail, but we have over 7 million people in jail or on probation or on parole. And unjust drug sentencing policies have greatly escalated the incarceration of minority, of minority adults and youth. And the two-thirds of all those who are in prison and two, most and two-thirds of those who are in juvenile detention are not there for violent offenses, they're there for nonviolent offenses. And we need to really begin to look at our policies. These are community tragedies but this is an, an, an impending national catastrophe that affects every one of us. They are ripping apart millions of families, these numbers, stripping away the right to vote for many, and blocking the chance to get a job to support a family so it becomes a, re a revolving door. They decrease public security as more and more prisoners re-enter society without the means to legally support themselves, and they drain taxpayer dollars as increasing billions are spent on massive incarceration of young and old, and we need to change course. I can't think of a dumber investment policy than to see our state spending on average three times more per prisoner than per public school pupil, and California spends almost four times as much. And in many ways, the increase in incarceration costs is exceeding the increase in higher education spending. I mean, this is crazy investment policy. I'm getting older. Um, I don't like to admit it, but I want to make sure that they're out producing jobs and, and that we are producing productive workers. We're going to keep our social security system strong and be paying for us rather than us paying and keep them in very costly jails. So I think we need to come together to have a paradigm change away from punishment as a first resort um, into prevention and early intervention. And we need to close up these feeder systems, and I invite you to join us in February, on the 25th and 26th in February. We're going to have a meeting on the cradle to prison pipeline in California, um, but nationally showing best practices, because the cradle to prison pipeline is not an act of God. It's a, it's, 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 these are a set of human choices that we have made. Um, and they're immoral in my view, they're political and they're economic, and they can and must be changed with strong leadership at the community level, the private sector, and the political level, and in our culture. Now, no single sector or group can change these child and nation-threatening crises alone, but all of us can together. And as leaders, we, we must demand that our leaders call us to the table and use their bully pulpits, and we must begin to convene and call people together to really begin to look at what is happening to our children and see how we can intervene to save lives and save families and save taxpayer money and save our nation's aspiration to be a fair society. Now, what can we do? I think that the first thing we can do is to just do our homework and to see what is happening and to look at what is happening in our communities. I don't know how many of you have ever been in juvenile detention facilities or into the prison systems and to see the mothers and the fathers there, but to see the young children there. I was in Los Angeles three weeks ago and went out to a youth camp to a book group of young people, um, mostly Latino and black, and when I asked them what their greatest fear was to a person, they all just assumed they were going to die very shortly. One little boy said, maybe 17 years old, these were children 15 to 19, um, that he was worried about how his mother would react when he was dead. They're totally preoccupied with death rather than life. And they're totally without hope. And what a terrible thing to do, 
to take away the hope and the dreams of a child and to not give them a sense of basic safety and adult protection. So we need to go in and see these children in these institutions and see what we're doing. But we all need to confront, and I hope you will look at this chapter on the cradle, look at the facts, and begin to sort of look at leaders and confront our leaders about whether we can't do better. And we know what to do. We need to vote for people who are going to vote to invest in children early. And one of the first things I hope we will all do, because we're at, I think, a nation transforming time, and we're going to be making some very fundamental choices. Go to the Children's Defense Fund voting record. Go, go look at our voting record on the website. And look at how the people who are asking for your votes at the Congress level, your representatives and your senators and your president, look at what they do. Because our political leaders in both parties love to kiss children in election campaigns. And then they go into the, to the legislature and they close their doors. And children are not standing outside those doors to lobby. Um, and so they tend to vote against children. But we do a nonpartisan voting record, and we have a list of how your California senators and congressmen voted on both sides. And for those who pass and have 100%, thank them very much. For those who flunk, please keep them at home. We don't need them in Washington. <laughs> children have enough problems. And I hope you will look at the voting records, because this is one of the rare times where we have three out of the four candidates for president with a long voting record. We don't have very much of a record on Governor Palin, but we do know that um, Barack Obama, who is in his fourth year in the Senate, and we don't have this year's because the Congress is not yet adjourned, but he had for his first two years 100% on Children's Defense Fund's voting record. Last year he had 60%, which is, we count absenteeism, um, absentee votes against you, but his cumulative score over the three years um, is 87%. Um, and we know what his proposals are on health care and early childhood development, and you should look at their platforms and look at what they're saying they're going to do, and look at what they're saying about education, look at what they're saying on tax relief for those in the middle and at the bottom, and then see how you're going to feel about what your choices are going to be. Joe Biden has been in the Senate since 1981, and he has had very many years when he's had 90 or 100 percent, and in the years when he was running for office, he's dipped too, but his cumulative average since 1981 on our voting records is 81 percent. We have had um, Senator McLean, um, McCain has been in the Senate since 1983, and his cumulative voting record um, has been less than 28 percent. I give my rounded out at 28 percent. And last year, he had a voting record on our children's voting card of 10%. And the good news about that, and it was the lowest in the Senate, the 10%, um, the good news for, about that, that he voted for the first time in many years to increase the minimum wage, which hadn't been increased in 10 years, because um, he'd voted against it previously three or four times. But he also voted twice um, to not overrule the veto, or override the veto of President Bush for an inadequate child health bill. It was so inadequate, the state children's health bill, the CHIP program, that we didn't really want it because it would have only covered four or five million children and not done any reforms in the benefit package. And we want all children covered um, because we don't think God made two classes of children. And we didn't approve of leaving five million children out. Um, but he voted twice not to even vote for that very watered down bill. And so I just hope, look and study the record, look at the tax positions, look at how they choose to spend money, look at what they've done on education and early childhood, and then vote what you think is going to be the best set of choices for our children. Now, we heard over and over again the double standards, which is why we have to raise a ruckus or build a movement that they couldn't afford, as we put in a bill to cover all children and all pregnant mothers last year, um, called the All Healthy Children's Act. And to give them all the same benefits, but it would have cost $70 billion over five years to cover all of our children, all of our pregnant women. And you know, they said we couldn't find it, we couldn't afford it. And look at how quick they found $700 billion to bail out the reckless scoundrels who have ended, you know, our economic stability. And I don't think we've seen the bottom of that. So next year, well, I do favor universal health care for everybody. And I do hope that you will ask all of your representatives how they're going to vote on covering America's people. Um, it's just outrageous that everybody does not have health care and is out. Um, and you're going to see that problem increased as more jobs are lost and more homes are lost. 
Um, and what are people supposed to do? We should have a health safety net. And I do hope we can really push our leaders to do health care for all. But if we can't get health care for everybody, we've been debating it about six decades now, I hope that we will also, as adults, say we should at least begin with ch all children first and all pregnant women, because children can't wait. They have only one childhood. They need their attention deficit disorders diagnosed right now before we expel them and suspend them from school. Um, we need, they need to be able to see the blackboard and hear the teacher right now. They need to get the investments they need to be able to perform well in school so that they are not acting out and we're not seeing school officials as we are seeing all over this country expel or suspend and even call police officers on the grounds to arrest children six and seven and eight years old for acting out. Um, I've thought we've lied. I think we, some of us adults have lost our minds when you think it requires three police officers with handcuffs and ankles and wrists to come and take a six-year-old off the school grounds in, in Florida. I think we can do better and we really need to um, hear the cries of children seeking attention and really begin to keep them in school. But the second thing we've got to do is to invest in early childhood development. If we can get them onto the earth in a more level playing field through health care and family support systems and home visiting programs. And most parents want to do the best thing. You can't teach what you don't know, though. And we really need to see that we get these children into care, provide them support, keep them out of that child welfare system. And again, poor children are at much greater risk. They are 22 times more likely to be neglected or abused and to move into the child welfare system. And we also have the spectacle of thousands of parents giving up their children, or judging themselves neglected and abused in order to get them mental health coverage, which they cannot get at the community level. And what a horrible thing. And so we've got all these children sitting up in juvenile detention facilities in order to get mental health care at the cost of at thousands of dollars of taxpayer costs. This makes no sense. So health care, but then early childhood development, we know about early brain development and the importance of the first three years of life. There are wonderful programs that can respond to this. And yet early head start of high quality reaches only 3% of the eligible children. And so we lay out a set of things that we need to get done in policy to close off the entry points into the prison pipeline and put children on a trajectory of success. And we know that achievement in school begins at birth and in the early years with good investments. And so we all need to have a high quality early childhood system, child care for working parents. And we know that children are in school only 17% of the school year, of, of the year of their time. And so we really also have to have very high quality after school programs and summer enrichment programs. The gangs and the drug dealers are available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We've got to open up these congregations. We've got to open up the doors of our community institutions and our schools and have children have a safe haven from the streets. And I'm going to come back and talk very briefly about Freedom Schools, which is a, a model that I'm very proud of that is run by college age students. Um, um, with a high degree of parental involvement. They have to come every week. Um, there's children 5 to 15, some of the scenes from the video are from our Freedom Schools. We have 138 of them, and we want to have some here in Marin County. Um, and they, we make learning fun. There's a very rigorous integrated reading curriculum, um, and the books are terrific. And we find when children, we said we want to teach children a love of learning. And they love having the teacher mentors from the counties where they grew up. They don't need Michael Jordan as a role model. They need somebody who grew up in the same area, went through a lot of the same problems that are coming to give back. And the energy of these college teacher mentors, and many of them are now going into teaching. And I'm very pleased that a third of them, or about a third to a half in most years, are black males or Latino males, and they, know, they want to give back. But these are young people that they can um, identify with. We train them down at the Alex Haley Farm, which is our leadership and spiritual renewal center near Knoxville, Tennessee. And we engage parents in weekly workshops. They all have to um, engage in service, and they all have to feel empowered and go out and be a good citizen and engage in a civic action. And there's nothing like watching the face of a senator when three or four hundred children walk in their offices asking why they're not getting health care or why are they not going to do something about guns. But the point is that children are not citizens in waiting. They are citizens now, and we have the example of the incredibly empowered children 
where there's little ruby bridges or the little rock nine or the Birmingham children who went to jail when no adults had the courage to do so when Dr. King issued the call and which led through their witness and sacrifice, standing up to fire hoses and to police dogs, to the voting to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So children need to be empowered from the beginning and they really will step up to the plate. We were very careful not to say that um, we were gonna increase reading scores, but it turns out and we have 19 freedom schools in Kansas City that um, in our first national evaluation of those freedom schools over a three year period, if you stay in those freedom schools for six weeks, we've stopped summer learning loss, let's put it that way. But if you stay in the freedom schools for six weeks over three summers, we found in Kansas City that our kids were picking up 2.2 years in reading gains. But they love, they love freedom schools. And the point is that schools should be about children and empowering children and making them feel that they're the center of things. And in too many of our child serving institutions, children are beside the point. It's the convenience of adults. So we're encouraging as many people as we know to go into service to, for children, as many people as we know to go into teaching for children. But we say teaching is a mission, not a job. And if you don't love all children, please get out of the classroom. Because even if you have the best qualifications and the best classrooms and the fanciest buildings, if you don't respect and expect all children to learn that you will do harm. So we need to make sure that we are really giving every child a first-rate education. The four figures that worry me so much, in addition to the prison pipeline one, so the fact that a child drops out of school every 10 seconds of the school day, these are children of all races, that a majority, 65% in 12th grade, but a majority of all children of all racial and income groups cannot read at grade level in 4th, 8th, and 12th grade, and that 80%, over 80% of black and Hispanic children cannot read at grade level, and many of them have already dropped out by 12th grade, and over 90% cannot compute at grade level in 12th grade. What does a child do if you can't read? in this globalizing economy. How is a child to get a job and to be anything other than someone who functions beneath the law if they can't compute at the most basic levels? How are our children going to compete with Chinese children and European children and Indian children in this competitive arena? And so these are the figures that are going to really topple America. And I can't figure out where is our lack of will and our lack of skill. I believe this country can do anything it puts its mind to. I mean, we have sent spaceships to Mars and men and women to the moon. We've cracked a genetic code. We mine trillions of dollars through a mighty, mighty, a tiny microchip, and yet we can't figure out how to we teach children how to read in fourth grade and in eighth grade. So we really need a reckoning here about what's important. I don't think we have a money problem in America. We have a profound values problem. We don't have a children's problem, we have a profound adult problem and a commitment problem. And it is time to change our moral compass and really begin to get our children understanding that we're going to be there. So please let's vote. Please let's begin to make choices about professions that are going to enhance America's future and enhance the community around us. Please let's make commitments to try to begin to reweave the fabric of family and community. That will be a good buffer for children despite the external messages of the culture that glorify so many extrinsic things that are, are not of great importance. And let's see if we can rescue the spiritual baby from the bathwater of American materialism and put our children back on a path to, to moral purpose if we can. I hope that we will celebrate the resilience and the strengths of our children. One of the programs we started in Los Angeles was a program called Beat the Odds where we take high school juniors um, who have undergone homelessness and incarceration and neglect and abuse, but one teacher or a guidance counselor or a grandma or a church person saw something in this child and reached out and gave them a lifeline of hope, and these kids, these children are making it. And they have, um, we give them scholarships and computers and a shopping spree, and we try to put them on a ladder of leadership, and now we've got maybe 650 or 700 in our pool of young people who beat the odds and you should see them. They're lawyers and they're doctors and they're Peace Corps volunteers and they're giving back. We don't have a right to give up on any child. I think that every child is sacred and if you give them high expectations and a hand, they will grab it. They will live up or down to our expectations. So I hope we'll celebrate our children's strengths and I hope we can begin to get beat the odds programs here 
in Marin County, and I invite you to come down to Los Angeles on December 4th and see what a Beat the Odds program um, can do. And I hope that privileged children can see the strengths of these children who are dealing with odds that many of us would never be able to survive. But let's begin to come together. In the book, I try to write a letter to parents because I think parenting is the most important and hard job in the world, and we don't support and prepare people for it. But we really do need to step up and, 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 and take family life seriously again. And we need to have policies and community supports that help parents be the good parents that most want to be. Right? But parents can't raise children by themselves. If, if the jobs move away, if the economy is in downturn, if they're working two or three jobs and can't get health care, we need better public policies and community support programs. And children should not be punished because, for the parents that they did not choose. And so we should get our clear thinking um, um, going here. And, um, and whether or not we like these children um, or like these parents, it is still in our self-interest to invest in making them productive rather than the opposite. Um, secondly, I do hope um, that we will be better neighbors and that we will be a part of a broad community. Um, we were community property when I was growing up as a child in the segregated South that told me I wasn't worth much, but I didn't believe it because my parents said it wasn't so, my preacher said it wasn't so, my community elders said it wasn't so, and so we knew it wasn't so. But that sense of community, of having adults who felt the sense of responsibility for you, um, I think has waned and it needs to be rejuvenated. Because again, children need community. I talk to teachers and educators who are, the most, who are so important. I talk to faith leaders because the church and mosque and, and we need to, and, and, and all faiths need to remember their, their tenants and really reach out and become a voice for the poor and for the weak and for the vulnerable. But too often, too many of our people of faith today are puppets rather than challenges of the culture. And I hope that we can regain our prophetic voice. And there are letters to citizens. Um, and that's my last point that I want to make. And while we are at a transforming time, I don't know what is going to happen next week at every level. Um, but I just hope everybody will get out and vote and take your children to vote so that they see you not as bystanders, but see that this is a part of citizenship. I take my babies from the time they were just little fellas. Um, but I think they should see parents engaged in, in taking responsibility for our democracy, and I hope we will go out and vote, but then I hope we will not think that a miracle's gotta happen, because if we citizens don't organize a citizen's movement, and a lot of people have been waiting for another Dr. King, or waiting for a new charismatic leader to come in and solve all of our problems, it's not gonna happen, folk. Dr. King understood that the movement made him. It took Mrs. Park sitting down um, to make you know the Montgomery community stand up, and Dr. King stand up, and, and that plan, and there are a number of citizens who had been waiting for the right spark that Mrs. Parks represented, um, who um, had organized to take advantage and to be able to challenge the segregation in Montgomery. But if we don't organize and be ready with an agenda for children, with the house having been robbed and it's gonna get worse, children are gonna get lost in the shuffle. And so we've gotta begin right now on the day after to say we've got to have health care for every child, we've got to end child poverty, we've got to have an agenda here that really begins to reverse the trend of taking from the weak to give to the strong. Um, and so we need to organize the citizens movement. And so I hope you will look at the chapter on citizens. I hope women and grandmothers especially um, will look at um, what we can do. I love men. I have a great husband. I had a great father. I have three great sons. I finally got two granddaughters too. Um, but I think it's time for women's voices as well and grandmas and grandpas' voices to be heard. We're just going to have to raise a ruckus if we're going to change the direction of the nation. And we must change the direction of the nation. And I hope we will understand that we can do it and we must do it. Let me just end um, with a quote from Albert Camus, which always moves me. He was speaking at a Dominican monastery in 1948, and he said, perhaps we cannot prevent this world from being a world in which children are tortured, but we can reduce the number of tortured children. And he described our responsibility as human beings if not to reduce evil, at least not to add to it, and to refuse to consent to conditions which torture innocence. I continue, he said, to struggle against this universe in which children suffer and die, and so must each of us. What the world, he says, expects of Christians is that Christians should speak out loud and clear 
that they should get away from abstractions and confront the blood-stained face of history that has been taken on today. The grouping we need is a grouping of men, and I would add women, resolved to speak out clearly and to pay up personally. I do hope that everyone here um, will begin to speak out clearly and be willing to sacrifice personally to see that the children that we um, have as our legacy will get what they need um, to carry our country and our world into a new century, that they will be grounded in love and rooted in valleys of a nation that honors those values by what we do in investing in the lives of the young and the weak. So thank you for letting me come and let's build our movement. Thank you.